are here to celebrate Indian National Science Day, which is usually celebrated every year on 28th of February, which is the birthday of Shidi Raman. So the, 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 we celebrate today here by talk by Professor Helen Smith. But uh, before we hear to her, uh, let me uh, request our director to say a few words. Yeah, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have a quick uh, giving this sort of talk on the National Science Day. National Science Day is celebrated on the day uh, of February 28th. Uh, the first uh, Indian science Nobel laureate, Sir C.B. Raman, announced his uh, Raman effect. Uh, so the government of India thought that. Uh, uh, celebrating Science Day on that day will motivate young people uh, to go into science and interested in scientific research and also popularize science in a way that, that uh, more people will get into it. Uh, so I'm glad to see close to 50, 60 people on this uh, live. Hopefully we'll have more over the period of time. Being a Saturday morning, I think uh, things are a bit slow. <laughs> But uh, it's a pleasure to uh, pleasure to have you, Susan uh, and uh, I thank you very much for uh, coming so early in the morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me now uh, request uh, Shubhamka Datta, who is the current head of the Department of Physics, to introduce Helen, and then we'll go to that now. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and good evening, good evening Professor. Queen. So as uh, Arnav and our director mentioned, National Science Day is celebrated in India on 28th of February each year to mark the discovery of the Raman effect by Indian physicist Sir C. V. Raman on 20th February 1928. This, this day is celebrated in all the schools, universities, academic, scientific, medical, and technical institutes in our country. The first... Oh, that's... The first National Science Day was celebrated in 1987. Every year, the National Science Day is celebrated with a theme. The theme of the last year was Women in Science. This year, our theme is Future of Science, Technology, and Innovation, and its impact on education, skills, and work. Isar Bhopal is honored to have Professor Helen Kui from SLAG National Accelerated Laboratory amongst us to celebrate the National Science Day 2021. Professor Kui is an eminent theoretical particle physicist. She received her PhD from Stanford University. After her postdoctoral works, Professor Kui joined Harvard University before moving to Stanford as a professor in physics. Professor Kui made pathological contributions in particle physics. She has received several awards and accolades for her outstanding contribution in the field. Professor Queen is the winner of the prestigious Dirac Medal of ICTP for her pioneering contribution to the quest for a unified theory of quarks and leptons and of the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions. She was the first woman to receive this award. Professor Queen has also received Order of Australia, Oscar K. Medal from Royal Swedish Academy of Science. Sakurai Prize, Benjamin Franklin Medal, Carl Taylor Company Medal, and many more. Professor Queen is not only recognized as a renowned physicist, she is an, edu she is an educator simultaneously. She co founded and became the first president of the contemporary physics education at FLAC. She planned and led the work of the NRC Study Committee and produced a framework for K 12 science education. The amazing combination of, passionate, of a passionate physicist and a passionate educator makes her truly unique. Recalling the theme of the last and the current science day, we are delighted to have Professor Queen with us today to celebrate the National Science Day 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Helen Queen to deliver the National Science Day Colloquium at Isar Gopal. Uh, so uh, we are muting ourselves and it's up to you. Uh, we can see a lot of people showed up now. 
Uh, so if we have questions, we, we will we'll ask you up to you. Yeah, I will give some time for questions at the end, of course. Uh, so my theme for today is, is why do we teach science? Who needs to learn science? And what research on learning tells us about how teaching and learning in science and then based on that research, a particular vision for how we can teach science. This vision was designed for pre-college, high school, or and before science learning. But I think there are many parts of the message that carry over to the university level and even some of it to the graduate level. So before I start, I want to apologize. I don't know a lot about it, education in India. I know a little. I grew up in Australia, so I know something about an exam-based education system and uh, sort of a system that mimics the British system, which I know the Indian system was at some point. How much it's evolved from that, I don't know. Uh, so you're going to have to decide any, if anything I say or what parts of what I say are applicable in your framework. And I apologize, I'm not an expert on every system in the world. The other thing I want to say is anything you do take on, change is not something that happens overnight. Change is a long, slow process and requires many different levels of work. And I will talk about some of those levels as we go through. So thinking about what it is that you want to achieve if you want to change your systems or if you want to change even the way you teach. It's not an overnight thing. And finally, this is a lecture about why you shouldn't give lectures. So obviously I'm not practicing what I preach and therefore I will make my slides available to you because one of the things that research on learning tells us is that nobody can hold more than about seven ideas in their short-term memory before they do something with those ideas to process them and transfer them to long-term memory. So I can tell you a hundred things, but you'll only remember at most seven of them. And that's not so good. So you have a chance to go back, the lectures being recorded and the slides will be available. So if you do get interested in this, and then I will mention some resources that you can also look for and, and download freely and use to, to read more about this. So why do we want everybody to have science education? And I really mean everybody. We have traditionally thought of science education about being producing scientists and engineers and finding those people who can and want to become scientists and engineers. I think that's a side effect. If you do good science education in pre-college and college, you will produce more scientists and engineers because you encourage those who get interested to stay interested, whereas bad teaching can turn students off. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, we still find that of the students who enter university thinking they're going to major in science, a large fraction of them decide after the first year that science is not for them. And furthermore, and this is, I will many times during this talk be quoting Carl Wyman, uh, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist who did turn to serious science education research. And like me, I just talk about it. He does it. Uh, and one of the findings he made was that if you ask students what science is like, their description of what science is and does before they take their first year university courses is more like the expert's view of what science is and does than it is after they take their first year university course. In, in other words, we teach them that science is something that it isn't by the way we teach science. That's not such a good message about our teaching. So we want everybody to know something about science because we live in a science rich society and everybody must make choices for themselves and for their community in which understanding not only knowledge of science but knowledge of how science works can inform decisions. I give you one recent example with the COVID epidemic, uh, you hear people saying, well, the experts don't know anything because they changed their mind. Well, we know that as evidence is collected, 
you sometimes know things you didn't know to start with and you change your mind on the basis of the evidence. So changing your mind is not an evidence for not knowing anything. In fact, it's an evidence for having learned something. So we want students to understand that. We want students to be able to analyze, interpret data, to evaluate the information they've been giving, given, to find out what's good information and what's junk, and to argue from evidence when they're arguing for a position. All of those things is you learn when you learn to do science not when you learn to remember science facts. So I'm really preaching for a quite different goal in teaching science. It's a societal goal. It's a vision of science literacy. It's making people able to apply science and engineering practices, science and engineering thinking, what we call cross-cutting concepts, which are ideas which scientists use all the time and we very rarely teach, and you'll come to a list of them later in the talk, as well as the science facts and, and knowledge that they've learned as tools for making sense around of the world around them, as tools for solving problems, and as tools for community decision-making. That means we need, a, that if we do that, if we achieve that, we will provide an opportunity for more and a more diverse group of people to be able to address unexpected and ill-defined problems by applying what they learned in their school science. And we will attract more and more diverse students to careers in science because they'll find out that doing science is interesting, even if learning what other scientists did, it doesn't always interest students or interests only a limited set who've already for some reason decided that science was interesting. So what does research on learning tell us about this? It tells us first that the traditional ways we teach, which is teaching what science has learned and saying, this is what you must know. And these are the problems that you have to learn how to solve. And these are, this is the way you solve them is not very effective. It discourages more students than it engages. And it doesn't, give them an opportunity to process the knowledge so that they can actually make it part of their working knowledge. They can remember it and do well on tests and still not apply it when, when faced with a real world situation. Uh, this little phrase, if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. My father-in-law was an FBI agent. And after he died, I found a card in his wallet that was put out by the US Army about training soldiers somewhere in the 50s, I think. And it had this phrase at the bottom, which meant, you know, if you haven't taught the soldier how to shoot his gun, uh, you haven't taught. It's not that he didn't learn it, it's that you didn't teach him. And thinking of it in that way puts the responsibility for learning, not only with the student, but with the teacher. Very often students fail to learn, not because they don't have any ability to learn, but because they did not have opportunities to learn and experiences that made them want to learn early enough in their learning cycle that they became active learners. And so thinking about how do we teach to engage students and make them want to learn the material we're trying to teach them is as important as thinking about what it is we want them to learn. And as I said, even those that test well under the current system, they may get an A in their physics course, but you ask them a real world physics situation and they cannot apply any of their physics learning to that real world situation. Because they've only learned to solve specific, very preformed problems. I'm hearing somebody else's voice. I think when somebody needs to be muted. Uh, so this question of how you teach is teaching for engagement and teaching for learning that can be used. And to learn to use something, you have to practice using it. So you have to practice doing the practices of science in order to be able to use them and in order to be able to use your science knowledge effectively 
in your later life. There's a lot of studies coming out of the National Academy of Sciences in the US, the National Academy Press, www.nap.edu is the place to go. And all of these studies can be freely downloaded in PDF form. This is a whole set of covers of, of science related studies. And I advise you to explore them, particularly in the next slide, I list the names of a few of them in a way you can read. Uh, Taking Science to School is a study that looks at K-8, students kindergarten through eighth grade, how should you teach science for them? But again, it carries forward. And the, the ones on the right, Ready, Set, Science is a volume oriented to teachers. The, the first is a study of the learning sciences and what the learning sciences have to say, and it's fairly technical. The Ready, Set, Science is examples and how this plays out in the classroom. And Ansus Marcus and Ciencias, the people in Chile decided they wanted a, a Chilean version of that document. So you can actually get it in Spanish as well. Not very useful in India, but interesting to see that these things do propagate that way. A framework for K-12 science education is a study that I led and it had uh, nine scientists, all of them members of the National Academy of Sciences, a couple of them Nobel Prize winners, and nine people with education experience, education research or teaching or people who'd been state level science administrators. And that committee together came up with this document that says, this is how we should teach science in the US. And that document is having a huge impact all around the world. And most of what I'm talking about today is in that document one way or another. So it would be worth your looking at. How people learn is a study from the learning sciences. And it's two because it's an update of a much older study. But definitely if you're interested in thinking about what, how you should teach so students learn better, it's worth looking at. And discipline-based education research is a study of research on teaching at the college level. And there's, you know, there's physics education research. There's also a, a physics, physical review education research. If you start getting interested in actually reading the papers about physics education research, this is a good introduction and then going into the, the actual published papers of the field. But the National Academy Press is a place to start with getting these and all of these documents have a, a lot of references to other studies. Okay, good teaching isn't easy. You have to know the area, you have to know the subject you're teaching, of course. But beyond that, you actually should know something about what's called pedagogical content knowledge, the science of teaching that subject. I'll give you a simple example. If you're a math teacher and a student gives you a wrong answer to a problem, you can probably figure out from that answer what that student did wrong and what their, what their misunderstanding is. The same thing is true in physics. You should know what topics students find difficult and what are the preconceptions that make those topics difficult? And how do you teach so that the learning actually replaces those preconceptions with the scientific conception you want to have and doesn't just layer it over as this is school knowledge, but the world really works the way I understood before. And I'll keep thinking about the world in the old way, even while I answer my exams in the new way. Changing people's minds about things is not an easy thing to do, and teaching is changing people's minds. You also know, need to know the art of teaching in general, how to engage and, and keep your students working. It's different at different age levels, of course, but there are things you do, should know. Then you have to plan your course. So you really have to do a design job to design and plan how you're going to teach and what you're going to teach in each lesson and what your goals are for what the students, you really should think, what do I want the students to know three years after they take this course? And how am I going to design this course so they will know that? Not what do I want them to be able to do in the exam at the end of the course? Because 
good, good students can study and do very well on exams and forget it the next day. And then you need to be an actor because engaging students is getting there and talking to them and being with them. We were just talking before this talk began how much harder that is in the COVID days where we cannot see our audience. I can see you, but I cannot see your faces. And uh, I can see a few of you. But the art of responsive teaching of acting and responding to the needs of your students as you teach is uh, improvisational theater among other things. And that we have to learn to do too. So it's a demanding job and doing it well isn't easy, but begin knowing what the goals of learning are and thinking carefully about how to meet those goals is really important. So thinking about the outcome goals before you start is very important. Uh, learning research tells us that if you want learning that can be used and built on later, the students have to be actively engaged in sense-making and problem-solving tasks, not just learning to recite things and learning to do standard problems. They need a classroom culture that makes them all feel welcome, safe, and respected. If a student doesn't feel respected, it's not a good environment for them to learn in. They need opportunities to practice the skills you want them to learn in varied contexts. Again, not just standard problems. They need the time you have with them has to be used effectively. And what's called the flipped classroom. So the part we do in lecture is the part we should be having them do with recordings, with video, with simulations, with all kinds of things outside the classroom. So that the time in the classroom where they're together can be spent working together and actually doing problem solving with guided instruction from a, a mentor in the room. The stress should be on the big concepts, not just the how to, so for knowing that, you know, how to do this particular kind of physics problem is not really very useful knowledge in, in life, but understanding some basic physics concepts is probably pretty useful knowledge in life. And then laboratory work should be really laboratory work, investigation, not just following procedures. And then that means if what you want them to learn is to be able to do things, that then you have to design your exams and tests so that you're testing for those things you want them to be able to do not just for did they remember these facts or can they do problems of type A, B, and C. So that means the flipped classroom, you're doing different things in the class. And this is a challenge in the university setting. I see your lovely big lecture hall. Well, if you have 300 students in the room, it's hard to make it interactive. And so it actually requires some rethinking of the spaces and architecture to go all the way to the result I'm talking about in a university context. It's easier to do in a high school classroom where there's a smaller number of students. So thinking about how you can move in the direction of more active learning, even in the context where you have a big lecture hall, I'll come back to that a little later. So why do, do we do labs? in science learning. We often think we're doing them to teach laboratory techniques. On the other hand, most of the labs, particularly we have undergraduates do and you know, high school students have equipment that no scientists would use today. And we don't give them the tools that are the actual tools that scientists use. So what tools are they learning to use? And the other thing is we do the labs because we think the lab demonstrates for them that what we're telling them in class is actually true. Students don't see it that way. Again, Carl Wyman has done studies on this. And if you ask the students what the lab is for, it says, they say, well, it's really very boring and we just have to follow the rules and then we'll get the good grade, but I don't know why we're doing this. They learn little about the science and less about science investigation by doing a lab where they just told, this is the procedure, follow it, and then 
write up your lab and show me your result. Just take a simple example. Allow, and I'm going to use physics examples, of course, because I'm a physicist. So we have a student in an elementary course doing a lab with a pendulum and measuring properties that they've been told, here's the formula, show that, the, that this formula applies to this pendulum. Well, Carl Gleiman points out, it would be much better to ask them, under what conditions does this formula apply and when doesn't it work? because it's a simplified formula, which only works for small angles. And when they really study the, the, the situation, they find something quite different from what they were told was the rule that pendulums follow. So having them, asking them, is this formula working, rather than asking them to reproduce the formula is a very different way of approaching the same lab. So, Better yet, if they can design their own investigation to answer their own questions, they'll learn a lot more about how scientists think and what you have to do to find out something by investigation. Even if it's a very simple problem they're trying to solve, very simple question they have, recognizing how difficult it is to actually answer such questions and how you have to keep refining the question until you can answer it is learning a lot more about science than doing a standard lab. So I think we all sit and I, I'm assuming everybody in this room is either a, or listening to this lecture is either a science professor or a science student who's gotten to university level science. So the way we learned science worked for us. Uh, why should we change it? And there's two answers to that. First is, uh, we were teaching for a different time. But remembering information is not really a valuable skill today. I can find information quicker this way than I can by remembering it very often. Uh, doing repetitive calculations is not really a very valuable, valuable skill today because computers do it better than most of us and they produce better data plots than I can do by hand, I too. So, learning to use modern technology tools effectively and learning the skills that computers don't have is much more important than learning to be a second rate computer. And so being able to analyze data and evaluate information, those are critical skills for the world today, not just for scientists, but for everybody. And this is why we need to change how we talk, teach, so that students come out with the skills that matter and not the ones that are replaced by machines. The other thing I think is those of us who became scientists or even became science undergraduate students are students who for some reason or other got interested in science and also who learned how to learn. We learned how to take notes, how to study effectively, how to outside the classroom, figure out what it was the lecturer was telling us. We didn't learn from the lecture. The lecturer only told us what we needed to learn. And then we went away and learned it by working on it. But most students didn't. And many students got turned off by those lectures and left the field who could have become capable scientists. So what, why change what worked for us? We're a small percentage. And the notion that we're the small percentage that could and the others that couldn't is just plain wrong. The students who leave are often just as capable as the ones who didn't leave. They just didn't want to put up with the way we were teaching them. The other question is, am I talking about dumbing down the curriculum? And first of all, I'm saying, whenever change comes along, the establishment says, well, no, we've been doing it right forever. So when we stop teaching Greek and Latin to all students, the people said we were dumbing down the curriculum. We were changing what was taught because the world needed different things. And I think we're in that position again. The world needs different learnings than the ones that the traditional education system that we still have in most of the world emphasizes. Memorization and rote procedure are low order skills. Analysis, 
analysis and reasoning is what we want. And you don't teach analysis and reasoning by asking people to memorize facts and do road problems. Of course, that doesn't mean that knowledge isn't valuable. We have to get the big concepts and get people thinking about how you learn and how you find information when you need knowledge and how you know whether that is good information or bad information that you're finding because you can go on the web and you can find really good information and you can find really bad information. So one of the skills you need is how to figure out the value of the information you're looking at. And the other thing is when the world throws problems at you, they're usually pretty ill-defined problems, ill-posed problems. And going from an ill-posed problem to a well-posed problem that you can actually begin to tackle, that's a skill you need to learn by practicing it. And our students should be doing that. So we talk about this as being three-dimensional science learning. That's a term we made up as we wrote the framework. Uh, we said the students need to engage in the science and engineering practices. That's the first dimension. Uh, I'll give you lists in just a moment. The students need to learn to use cross-cutting concepts as problem-solving lenses. And I'll give you examples in just a moment. And then of course they need to learn some basic core ideas of major di disciplines of science across the disciplines and to be able to connect across the disciplines because you know, in sometime in the late 19th century, somebody decided that school science was biology, chemistry, and physics, and they had nothing to do with one another. And in the late 19th century, they really did have nothing to do with one another. But that's simply not true today. We live in a world where the, the lines between the disciplines have really gone away. Uh, it's not that there's not physics that's not chemistry and chemistry that's different from physics, but we understand that, that the biology functions by chemistry and physics and physics and chemistry is quantum mechanics. And all of these things are much less separate than they were when those disciplines were laid down as separate disciplines. But students cannot begin to understand that if we teach them and use the same words in different ways across dis disciplines. So we need to get a common language that students learn and can use across all of the disciplines. One of them is practicing. So this is our list of eight science and engineering practices. And we put engineering here because if you don't put engineering in, in elementary school and high school, if engineering ideas are not introduced to students there, where are they going to meet them? How's anybody going to know that engineering is something that fascinates them if they've never known what engineers do or thought, begun to think like an engineer or design anything? So I think this is a, a big step. And also because it's an application of science. And so learning science and using that science to design something is useful. So, Asking questions is something both science and engineers do. Defining problems also. Engineers have a particular way that they frame that defining of the problem, but also in science. The first question we ask is never quite the right question. We have to keep asking till we've got a question that we can actually investigate. Developing and using models. We all use models now and models, computer-based models are a big part of doing science in today, modeling systems on lots of different scales, planning and carrying out investigations, everything from initial observation to a fully designed experiment, analyzing, interpreting data, and you have to analyze and interpret other people's data as well as your own. So we put it as a separate one from carrying out investigations using mathematics and computational thinking, a tool for doing science that every scientist today uses, even biologists, right? It's a, a piece of, when you produce a graph from your data, you're using mathematics. When you use a spreadsheet, you're using computational thinking. I'm taking it the basics, but you can see how it works up till so you're using MathCAD or modern science tools for for doing your science. 
developing explanations. Well, that's the goal in, phys in science and designing a, a solution. That's the goal in engineering where you have a problem for which you're trying to design a solution. So both of those clearly are something we want students to do. That doesn't mean we want students to reinvent science. We want students to use the science that they're learning to explain phenomena that they're observing in the world. Engaging in argument from evidence, well, we hope more people can do that. At least in this country, we found that an awful lot of people don't seem to think that evidence matters. But if you learn how science does that, I think we will that's a skill for citizens as well as for scientists. And then I've already stressed the obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. All of those are skills that scientists need and learning how to do them as scientists do them is a useful skill for many more students than the students who are going to become scientists. But it's also a critical skill for the students who are going to become scientists. So when, where, and how did you or your students learn to do this? If you think about it, most of these things in the traditional system, we didn't really ask students to do until they got to graduate school. Very rarely did they design or, care or plan an investigation for themselves before that. So the whole set of things that we do as a scientist, you have to understand how they're done to understand how scientific knowledge is developed and when it's stable and where when it needs to when it's forefront and it's not fully settled and things are still being investigated all of those things you learn by doing this work and so it's not there's two things going on here you're learning to do these things and you're learning the role of these things in developing the knowledge that we as scientists over hundreds of years have developed and both of those things are critical to really understanding what science is and how to think about it. These things I call cross-cutting concepts. Every phenomenon you look at happens in some system. And understanding how to think about what is the system and model how what that system is, and in, within that system, look for mechanisms of cause and effect, to look for conservation, how track the flows of matter and energy into, out of, and through the system, to look at the relationships between structure and function and the components of the system, to ask under what conditions is this system stable or is it changing and how does it change? Or how can I make it change in a controlled fashion? When does it run away from me? When are the feedback loops supporting a controlled system and when are they supporting a runaway system? Those are all things that we think about as we try to understand phenomena as scientists. And they're things that we want students to know are useful ways of looking at something they don't understand. Each one of these points here, looking for patterns and asking what made that pattern happen. Thinking in terms of scale and quantifying things, measuring them, looking about relationships between quantities in the system. All of these things are things scientists do when they're facing something that they know nothing about. These are ways they approach finding out about it. And generally, we've expected students to sort of get this on the side rather than to understand it as these are tools that work across all of science. Uh, let me take one energy. The way we teach energy in physics, the way we teach it in chemistry, and the way we teach it and use the term energy in biology, very hard for a student to take those three different thing, places where people are saying the same word and understand whether, it, whether or not it's the same concept that they're really looking at. And it wouldn't take much, but it takes coordinating across the disciplines to find language where they can make the connections rather than where we're making it hard for them to make the connection. Understanding why conservation is important that because these things are conserved, it's worthwhile tracking them because they limit what can happen. If you don't have the energy or you don't have the matter, certain things can't happen. And that 
I find when I talk to non-scientists, the notion that we can say what can't happen is something that the majority of people don't actually believe. Knowing that there, there are things we can definitely say cannot happen is hard for people to believe. It's easier for them to believe to, that we can predict something that will happen than that we can say this will not happen. So, and of course, in complex systems, it's much harder both to predict what will happen and to say which things are impossible. But tracking what matter and what energy is flowing through that system can help us understand how that system is functioning. So, just examples. Of course, the disciplines matter, and there are core ideas in every one of them. We lump them into physical sciences, which is physics and chemistry, life sciences, biology and ecology, earth and space sciences. I put a line on my screen. That's weird. And engineering technology and applications of science. Engineering, I said, because we wanted it to be there, but also because when you ask scientists to define what's important for students to learn in their disciplines, they never get around to the application. But for the students, knowing that this stuff is useful in the world and has some purpose is often what motivates them to learn it. So thinking about where our science applies in the world is important. I put some definitions at the bottom because we found that not everybody had common definitions of these words. Technology does not mean just computers. In, in school systems, very often they say technology, when you say technology, they mean the computer or the cell phone or whatever. But a technology is anything that's a product of the engineering process, applying some understanding to develop some new thing or some new system or some new methodology to solve problems. And technology therefore is not a discipline, it's sort of the, the thing that comes out of putting engineering and science together. And the other piece that I think is really important for people to understand, there's a lot of science we do today that we couldn't do 50 years ago because we didn't have the technology for it. The most recent example is the development of COVID vaccines in, in a year. We couldn't have done that even five years ago. So understanding how new science enables new technology, but also how new technology enables new science, I think is, is a very important part of learning about the relationships between science engineering and technology, or science medicine and technology. Applications are a big part of why science is important in the world. So how do you do this? You ask the students to make sense of phenomena. You select the phenomenon for which the science you want them to learn is necessary to reach a good explanation. And then the students get motivated because they can't explain it. They know they need to learn something in order to explain it. And this is the place where the science learning comes in. I am going to diagram this process in a moment, but, but it's very nonlinear process, just like science research. The learning process is a process where you make iterative steps, changing your understanding until you get to an understanding that you find satisfactory. And the student has to have the responsibility for doing that, for, for developing their own model refining their model. Their model won't be a very good one to start with, but if they go through the process, they can make it better and better. And you can help them make it better and better as they learn the science incorporated in their model. And that is the process we want students to do. And the teacher is the facilitator of the process, not the person who's telling everybody how to do it and what the answers are. So here's a very complex looking diagram. I'm going to explain the diagram and then I'm going to go to a closer up one. I don't know how this red line came on my screen or where it came from, but I apologize. It just appeared out of nowhere and I don't know how to get rid of it. So the, this diagram has five columns. On the left is the real world, my left. And on the right are uh, 
information resources, which might be other people, might be books, might be movies, videos, whatever other sources you're using for information. In the middle is the student trying to make sense of the world and developing ideas. So we start with some phenomenon in the real world and we make some initial observations of it. And the student brings whatever knowledge they have of the world and they start asking questions about it. And from the questions they come to develop an initial picture of what the system is. And it's good to get them to put that picture on paper because once they have it on paper, they can begin to see how it works and whether it works and what, how they can make it better. Whereas when it's just a vague idea in their head and they haven't put it down on paper, it continues to be the same vague idea in their head, no matter what you're telling them. So getting them to get their ideas down into their model is, is a big step in allowing them to change their ideas. And then they can go either way. They can go back to the phenomenon and make more observations because they have, as they try to make a model, they have to look again. Or they can go talk to their friends who have made their models and get information from other groups of students. And they revise the model. The little orange circles means that this is an iterative cycle that they might go around several times. And you see in this process, which starts at the beginning with initial observation and ends at the end with them having a model that they've tested and an explanation of the phenomenon, is nonlinear. It doesn't have a single path. It has lots of loops where it goes back and re revises and rethinks. And it's the process we do as a scientist when we're trying to explain something, as well as the process that students do. And these things called SEPs, those are the science and engineering practices numbered with the numbers from there before. But these are the, the questioning, the model building, the obtaining information, the analysis. All of this happens between the phenomenon, the information resources, and the students' own development of their ideas. So this is just a bigger one. So you can read some of the words on here. I think better you go and study it afterwards if you're interested in this. Thinking about learning as a process like this is very different than thinking about learning as, okay, you're the student and I'm telling you this is true and now you've got, got to remember it. That's a very different kind of process. So thinking about learning in this way and designing your course so that there's time for students to do some of this as many times as possible in as many different contexts so they can learn to think like scientists is what I'm talking about. Why engineering? Because it's an opportunity to play, apply the science learning. And an engineering design problem has a very similar cycle of iterative cycle, recursive cycle of, of attempt, test, revise, and refine. It helps students engage with science in a different way. It helps many more students see the point of learning science. And it gives them a tool, a, a skill that they can take out into the real world and use in their lives. I stress this point about iterative and recursive because it's very different from the way we've tended to teach. We tend to ask students only questions for which we already know the answer and it's either right or wrong. There's no correct design and there's no correct model for a system. There's only better and worse ones, right? So anyone is and develop and get it, make it better. As I said, the students' models put their ideas forward explicitly, and that means they can recognize when they don't work. And failure of a model is not a failure of learning, it's a learning opportunity. It says, oh, I didn't understand that. I have to go back and understand it better in order to make my model work. So revision and refinement are part of the learning process. They are, in fact, the place where the learning is happening. And so giving students that opportunity to not be afraid that their initial model won't be right 
They're not, we're not asking them for the right answer. We're asking them for their answer and their best understanding so that they can take their best understanding and change it. And this is the key to why this method of teaching is different and better for more students than the way we have traditionally taught. Students don't get shamed by being wrong. They get taught, oh, that's interesting, try again. And they get engaged with trying again because as long as you convey that you believe they can make their ideas better and get better at it, they are very willing to try to do that. It's when they're to told all the time that, that they're not good at something, not explicitly perhaps, but implicitly by the tests that are given to them, uh, they give up and don't want to follow that path. This means you're going to have to cover fewer topics. You cannot cover everything in the textbook this way because it takes time to do this process. But the interesting thing is if you take that time in second grade, in third grade, the children come in with a different attitude to learning science. You take that time in your undergraduate classes, more students will want to go on and do graduate classes in science. So you have to change the syllabus and you have to change the way you test the knowledge that's being learned to allow this kind of teaching. So there's a lot of changing of the system to make this teaching fully part of what the system expects and what the students get to do because the system won't change unless the tests change because the way you're teaching works pretty well at getting the students to pass the tests you're giving them. But unfortunately, it doesn't work very well at giving the skills you want them to take out into the world or even the skills you want for the next course they're taking. So they have to practice and practicing takes time. But once they're doing this and once they're making sense, the depth of the thinking that even young children can do and the depth of the thinking that you'll see from your undergraduates will be quite different from what you see when you're giving them a set of not very interesting things to do. Not interesting to them, they may be fascinating to you because you've learned how and why they're fascinating, but they don't see the point. So the real challenge of teaching this way, aside from deciding you're going to do it and having a system in which it's permissible to do it is the designing, the planning and pacing and orchestrating a sequence which achieves the level of learning you want them to achieve of the subject matter and at the same time the level of learning you want them to achieve of all these skills and practices and ideas that are about learning how to do science not just what science has learned in the past. And in order to teach this way, a teacher has to have experienced some of this doing. And you can't teach students how to uh, analyze data if you've never analyzed data yourself. So this means different training for the teachers in our schools. And this is a big challenge and takes time. And I was saying this, this framework was published in the US in, in 2011, we have 42 states who are trying to change their, at least 42, I'm not sure exactly what the number is today, uh, trying to change their education systems to move in this direction. It's now 2021. And I would say we're maybe halfway down the road to, to making these changes and having teachers who are capable of doing this kind of teaching across the board, it's a long, slow process. And it needs, it has implications for how teachers are trained, both before they become teachers and when they're in teaching. And I would say it has, in, in, at the faculty level, it has inf implications for how faculty think about teaching and what they do. So thinking about whether you want to move in these directions, how you can move in these directions and what's a, a, a reasonable pacing to make the changes at.
I think I've said everything on this slide. I think the main point is that this is not just about producing for, for future scientists. It's about preparation for life and work in the 21st century and becoming thinking citizens and community members. And this is important. And it's important for everybody, not just for the privileged few who are going to become scientists. So thinking about how broadly this can apply in your world, in your country, in your schools, that's the question I leave to you. But everybody today meets situations where they have to make decisions about what to do, for example, in a pandemic, how they interpret what they're being told to do and how they carry it through in, in their life and in their community. It's important to have the skills to think about the knowledge you're being given, the information you're being given, and what information, at least in this country, we've had very bad information as well as very good information given and uh, having people choose among that information in intelligent ways has not been terribly successful in some parts of the country, which means we didn't do a good job of this kind of teaching in the past. Now, as I've mentioned, teachers can't ignore what's on the test. They have to teach to the test. That's because their, their success is measured by how well their students do on the test. So if you want to change the way teachers teach, you have to change what it is you test. You have to ask the question, are you really testing for things that you, in the long term, value for your students? And if you can design teach, tests so that when the teachers teach to the test, the teaching will be the kind of teaching I'm talking about here, that is a challenge. But it means you have to design assessment activities that are pushing things in the right direction. Best if you can to design real problems that students have to apply their knowledge to solve that they haven't seen before, rather than tests where they're asked to do the kinds of problems they've more learned before. And that is a real challenge and requires a really different kind of teaching to reach that challenge. But it's not easy to design the testing either. Exhibitions, projects and exhibitions is a big part of what you might want to think about. How do students show that they can do? I made this statement before about 19th century disciplinary silos. And I think we have to keep coming back to it. We have to talk to our faculty friends in other disciplines and think about, you know, when you teach, let's talk about undergraduates, right? When you teach in introductory chemistry and introductory physics, can the students who are learning about energy and potential energy in physics make any connection between that and bonds in chemistry? And do they think that bonds are positive or negative potential energy? The whole idea of negative potential energy is something that needs to cross the disciplines before they can really understand chemistry. So understanding that potential energy is always defined relative to some reference system and that the reference system in chemistry is, is chosen because bond energies are very small compared to atomic masses. They make the reference system the free atoms and then get the masses out of the problem. So we only talk about binding energy. We don't talk about total energy ever in chemistry. In fact, we don't talk about total energy ever except in particle physics. So figuring out what energy we're talking about and why, and why, and when biologists say energy, they actually call biomass energy. Biomass isn't energy, it's fuel. And yes, in an oxygen rich environment, it's what you need in order to, to have energy, to release energy, you need both the fuel and the oxygen but the oxygen is all around you. So you only keep track of the, of the fuel, which is the biomass to understand the flow of energy in ecosystems. 
But that's a shortcut which students don't get unless you explain it to them. So they think they're being told biomass is energy and they can't put that together with anything they're learning in chemistry or anything they're learning in physics. So figuring out how we can teach so all of those things can go together is important. These methods I'm talking about, I've talked mostly because the framework study was directed to K-12 education. I talk mostly about K-12, but I guess I'm running a little late here, aren't I? I should speed up. The methods apply, I think, at the college level. The research on learning, a lot of it at the college level says very, very similar things. And figuring out how to make this work in university classes is a second effort. The, as I said, the space isn't great and doing it when you can in, in, in smaller classes, in 60 student kinds of classes, take some reorganization of how the university space is used and how the faculty is used and how you bring in student instructors. Peer, we're, we're talking about peer instruction. This means students who are maybe took the course last year can facilitate a lot of the learning and also learn a lot themselves by being the trained to guide the discussion and, and work with the small groups when you divide your students into small groups. I'm looking at the time and I'm rushing. So I think it's probably better if I stop here and let you ask your questions rather than running through. I think I have three or four more slides, but I, I'm getting a little repetitive at this point. Anyway, I just want to go to my last slide, which talks about the issue. If we want, if we really talk about everybody needs to know science, then it's an equity issue that everybody gets an opportunity to learn science. It means they need access to spaces, equipment, and materials. And perhaps you at the university can help schools in your area, high schools in your area, have access to some regional system to share equipment or think about how can we make this more, more real science learning accessible to more students across all of our systems. I think it's a responsibility of scientists to take some of this on. And I'll stop there and leave you to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Hello, doctor. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, as you uh, explained in your talk, a lot of the responsibility also now needs to follow. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding you. I think you need to face the mic a little differently or yeah, sure. Uh, is it better? Yes. So uh, you said that a lot of the responsibility also lies with the teacher compared to everything with the students, right? And uh, I wanted to ask, like, when you suppose I would not be in such a position, but maybe you face such positions where you had to fire faculty. And from what I know, faculty is mainly chosen based on academic qualification. Because currently there's no metric, there's no metric for teaching ability. So uh, how do you tackle that problem where you're able to judge the teaching ability uh, while you're not choosing someone for a faculty position? Well, teaching teaching is 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 an art as well as a, as a skill, right? And and I, I I I'm going down to one of the statements on this slide. You have to believe in in student capacity to learn. You also have to believe in teacher capacity to learn. If you think people come pre predetermined, this, this one is a mathematician, this one is a scientist, and they're going to be good at it, and those other ones are not. Well, you don't teach well, and the students don't learn well. It's very important. One, I think one of the critical things for teachers is to believe in the efficacy of students as learners, to believe that Almost anything you do, you get better with practice. And so no matter 
how good you are today at something, if you get the right opportunities to learn and to practice, you will get better at it. And this is true for teaching too, right? So that, that there are measures for good teaching, yes, but there are measures of good teachers. No, there are only teachers who, who strive to learn to be better and strive to improve their practice or teachers who don't. And, and the introducing into the whole education this system, this notion that everybody should be a, an ongoing learner throughout their professional career and strive to get better at what they do and then providing support systems that help them to do that is very, very important. And also helping them to understand this is just as true for their students as it is for them, that growth happens because you practice. Thank you. Thank you. Reflective practice. Uh, so uh, we have an, uh, one question from Amit Apte. Can you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great talk. It, I enjoyed it. Uh, so I have a question regarding the testing part you mentioned a little bit. Uh, so at least I think that the currently testing is mainly used as a tool basically for exclusion. A selection right. process, a university for a job and so on, rather than testing as a tool for helping the students to learn something. And those two aims cannot be, I mean, I don't know how to reconcile the two aims. Uh, is there a way to go from uh, more learning oriented testing rather than evaluation and exclusion oriented? Uh, we, talk, we talk in, in the US, we talk about formative and summative. And, and we make the mistake of getting them jumbled up together. So formative evaluation is the evaluation for learning. And summative evaluation is at the end of the course, did you learn, right? And a lot of our evaluation as a teacher should be in order for me to know what to do next as a teacher, I need to know what my students have learned and what they haven't learned. And so, the formative part is should all be oriented towards this uh, learning for testing for learning for testing which supports the student and the teacher both to know what needs to be done next. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. That is much more flexible, and and it doesn't have to be scored, and it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't even have to be separate from the learning activity, right? You can design activities where the students are learning and in that learning, they're producing products which you can evaluate to understand where they are in their learning. So the, the distinction between a testing activity and a learning activity almost disappears if you're doing formative assessment right. And okay. so yeah. that, that is certainly a piece you can build. Now, in the end of a course, in the, the system requires some level of evaluation. Personally, I'd like to get rid of, I, I don't think it should be done in elementary school. I, I think much less often should we be trying to, to say who's best at something. More we should be giving students opportunities to exhibit their skills. And so, you know, if you, if you want to develop artists, you don't ask them to do a test, you ask them to produce a piece of work as the, as the demonstration that they've learned something in their course. And, and there's an exhibition at the end of the work that students can do. I think we should think more about that, of having students do a project where they're investigating something. You can frame the project as an engineering design project or as a, as a science explanation project and you ask them to demonstrate that they can go through this process of asking questions and developing models and refining and testing their model and coming up with an explanation and producing the evidence for it and arguing from the evidence, all of those things. But again, that's very time consuming. You can also give them test items that ask for different things. 
for example, present an argument and ask them to evaluate this argument in terms of does the evidence support the claim? Is, is the data properly interpreted in this argument? So they can critique other people's arguments. That's actually mm -hmm. a fairly high level skill mm -hmm. of argumentation. So thinking how to frame problems which can be solved in some reasonable amount of time that ask, can the students engage in these practices and develop explanations for problems which they haven't seen before, develop approaches to the problem. It's a, it's a very different kind of test item, but you can do it as test item. Yeah. Okay, Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question here from the auditorium. So I pass on to my colleague, Hello, very nice talk, thank you. I have uh, one question related to the last topic. Right? So now if I want to use all these ideas in an exam, and I actually, is this working? Uh, can, can you hear us? I did not hear the question, I'm sorry. Ah, can you come here, Sebastian? Is this okay. um, Very nice talk, thank you. Right, so now if I want to use all these ideas in exams, right, I'm, I'm also lazy or don't have so much time for it. So very often it happens that I would have to design all the questions fresh from sketch. Right? Do you know of any plans or it would be really nice to have like a worldwide repository, say of nice conceptual physics questions that are not actually math questions in disguise. Uh, then, then yeah, I. It, it, there, there are there are some at some levels. So, for example, if you're teaching freshman physics, there's something called the force concept inventory, and it's a question, a set of conceptual questions around the concepts of mechanics. There are a few of those inventories at lower level. They're not really intended for exam questions. They're intended for probing student understanding of concepts. But you could use some of those. And there, if you if you just Google force concept inventory, you'll find it there. But in general, this is this is work in progress. I agree. It would be wonderful to have for each level, just as is having good examples of teaching, good examples of problems are a good way to go. And there's, a, there's some of them. Go to the, the physics education research papers and you can find references to some of them. The education researchers call them instruments. Instruments means the things we use to measure, measure with and and so tests are instruments for measuring student learning and comparing student learning but it's not something where it, it, it's easy to point you to all the, the the answer that you want and there's there's still a lot of work to be done and there's not a great deal of research being done on advanced level courses and how how this carries to you know, graduate level graduate level of course we do kind of apprenticeship training of our graduate students in addition to giving them courses. So it, it's very different probably, but the, because they're doing the kinds of things I'm talking about in the part that's not their coursework. But- It would be really useful to have that because of the time limitation that may have- I, I point you particularly to the, pay, the, the re, education research papers of Carl Wyman and the references in those papers will lead you on to others. And, and that will be a way to find some of this. But as far as I know, I do not know a repository of, of problems that you can just go find them. And, and I agree, it's extremely time consuming, particularly when you're first trying to do it, to design good problems that don't finish up taking 10 times as long as you thought they would for the students to attack them. Yeah, look, look these up, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, Aditya, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Aditya Oja? Sir. Yes, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, when we are discussing the different motives of uh, testing and assessments, whether we should and if yes, how should we modify our perspective of grades and uh, cumulative scores in academia as to 
this is a very big question at the when you have a system and i believe the indian system is a very selective system so we're talking about students being selected out of rather than into as somebody else said earlier the, the tests are used to filter right and in fact that filtering has been we've almost thought of ourselves as professors as being the ones who were trying to do that filtering and i have been working at the k-12 level where it's the opposite. What we need to do is generate a better pump that brings more students up to the higher level and brings more students into interest and, and brings more citizens who have these skills in their lives. And that I think is, is very different. So I am not really prepared to answer, how do you filter? I think you can always design ways of judging the quality of performance, no matter what performance you're asking for, right? So the question is, what quality measures really measure the things you care about? In fact, I think what we've done is use quality measures that exclude students who could be very creative scientists because they weren't quick at something that needed to be done in a certain time in an exam. But so in fact, we, we've been using measures which are not well matched to the need. And the more we can turn the measures towards who would make good researchers, who would make good engineering designers, and less to who can solve 30 problems in this one hour exam, uh, is it's a very different kind of testing and a very different kind. So I think you have to think about the goal before you can design the test. And the question is what matters? What skills and abilities matter? And how do you filter for those skills and abilities? And at what point do you start filtering? And I would, I suggest you need to start filtering late rather than early because students through K-12 at least, they come to the system with very different backgrounds. And if you filter early, you filter for home background and not for student ability. And so thinking about how you can design systems that provide greater opportunities for, for more students coming from more different backgrounds it's a challenge and it's not a challenge anybody's found all the answers to but i think part of it is when do you when do you decide it's time to filter versus when do you decide it's time to drive as many forward as you can with as many opportunities as you can in you know if you ask a, a development science a person who studies human development what develops depends on experience and children come to school with very different experiences. So if we want to give every more students the opportunity to develop the kinds of skills we're talking about here, we have to give them more experiences to compensate for the ones that they didn't get from their parents. And that, that's a big social engineering job, right? It, what we think education is is opportunity for all, but it doesn't always function that way because we don't design the system to function that way if we start filtering too soon. So that I I am pushing at the K-12 level for less filtering. I agree that eventually, as you decide who you're entering into who's entering into your advanced program, there's some filtering you have to do. But I warn against I hope. Hello. Yes, we got some feedback, but yes. Yeah, I, at some point our screen here in the auditorium froze. Uh, yeah, so um, I, 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 I actually have a question on the last thing you were mentioning. 
So I, as, a, as a teacher, at least in India, one of the challenges I personally find is that uh, so we get students from various cultures, various financial backgrounds, and a whole lot of diversity, right? And, and, and often the performance is, is due to, I mean, the student often do better because I have found that people with more financially better position have more confidence and they tend to do better in the class. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I mean, just my observation. So, but as a teacher, my, my, my role is, is, is to make sure that everybody respective of their background uh, uh, get the same opportunity and make best use of their talent, right? So do, right. do, you, do you have a, a suggestion for us to how to adjust that thing? Those, those well, the, the, the first, so I'm going to go back some way back through my slides. The one that had a statement about this on it is way back. What's found is one, there's two pieces. One, one is that question about teacher mindset. That, that if, if you believe that learning occurs through practice, then your job is providing opportunities to practice. But you have to provide opportunities at the level where the student is ready to take up those opportunities. And students arrive in your classroom at very different levels. So the cha challenge is to have opportunities that are broad enough and open enough that the students, it's not just the students who are well prepared who can take advantage of those opportunities, but the students who come with less preparation and less confidence. And one of the issues of confidence is, do they feel welcome, safe and respected in your classroom? Or do they already feel that it's very likely that you're not gonna pay much attention to them because, because of their background, because of their caste, if you like. I know that's an issue. Caste is a word that we don't use very much in the US, although there's a recent book that says we're actually practicing it. Uh, how do you make your classroom open and welcoming and visibly so? So a student who's not used to being one of the students who gets a lot of attention because the problem is if you're not a kindergarten teacher, you're not meeting students who haven't had many experiences with teachers before you. And, and that means the students come into the classroom already encouraged or discouraged as learners and figuring out how you can encourage the students who are, have been less encouraged in the past and build their potential higher is a very challenging thing. But you, the first thing is you have to believe that they all can learn. And then you have to say, how can I put opportunities in front of them so that given where they are today, they can learn and move them forward. And that means the opportunities have to be broad enough that the, the student who's quick and fast and already has learned five things doesn't overwhelm the student who hasn't yet learned those five things, but could learn them if you gave them the opportunity. It's not easy. I'm, I'm not saying I know how to do it in every situation. In fact, I know I failed at it in many situations, but it, it is something that working hard on the car classroom culture and the culture of, I'm not asking for the quickest right answer. I'm asking you to think. I'm asking you to make sense of the world for yourself. I'm asking you to do these things and practice them. And I believe if you practice, you will get better. And that's very, very different than saying every question, raise your hand if you know the answer, right? So it's, it's a different style of teaching which invites more than it uh, filters. Thank you. I will, I, will, I will try to follow. Yeah, my colleague have a question for you. Uh, hello, Professor Quinn. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, actually, I couldn't resist myself from asking you something that, like being uh, an, a physicist and educator, also uh, someone who is like a woman that we look up for, have you particularly faced like any particular problem for 
for your career just because you were a woman and i'm asking this from the time when you were a student in the school right well i got my phd right yes at the time when women were 2% yes i PhD. i read that too yeah so uh, yes of course i faced some problems along the way i'll tell you a funny story i can i i tell them these days as funny stories and they were in fact funny stories when i was a an undergraduate at stanford thinking about applying to graduate school my undergraduate advisor said to me well you know women graduate students schools are reluctant to accept women because they get married in one thing or another and they don't finish but i don't think we need worry about that for you and i said to think he did did he hear what he just said because <laughs> it was today people would not be that explicit he was not trying to tell me that i wouldn't do well as a graduate student in fact he was trying to tell me that i would do well as a graduate student and therefore he didn't worry but it sounded as if he thought i would never get married so <laughs> was, uh, the kind of thing that happened because people frankly said what they were thinking about women in science nowadays they they don't dare say it but they may still think it. So that that's actually more difficult I think to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and has it changed over the years? Like now when Absolutely. you are Absolutely. Yeah. Because because the numbers have changed, right? It's very different being one of 20% than it is being one of 2%. Yeah. And in our high schools today it's 50% women in, in the physics class. In undergraduates it's 30%. It's still not as high as it would be as i would like to see the graduate school but it's not 2% anymore it's like 15%. Yes. So numbers have changed and with numbers come more understanding and also i think there is more conscious effort on the part of organizations not necessarily every faculty member but certainly faculty as a whole to encourage a more diverse population into physics. I think in the United States today uh, it's more encouraging non-white minority students to to enter physics because that's still a, that's a much smaller percentage now than women and it was about the same as women when I when when it was 2% it was 2% minorities and 2% women now it's 15% women but it's still only like a much smaller percentage of minority students going into courses yeah run courses that's and, really and so, a hopeful thing and uh, and will you please just say in one line please to our girl students to motivate them that never to retire and try their best as much as they can i mean it would be great to have that from you well i think the so this there's a set of stages right first of all you want and when we're teaching young children we want to engage them we want them to get interested and and we do that by giving them interesting things to do right as you get interested once you become a scientist it's your identity and as a scientist you will beat your head against the wall even if it's not interesting and it's hard to get through to the part that you know is interesting so between initial interest and identity as somebody who does science or who likes science and gets engaged with science uh there's a whole progression and supporting students at every stage of that pro progression to deepen their interest and to deepen their confidence that even when a problem is hard they can find a way to get through it and and to get something out of it and to make some progress with it that's a learning process in and of itself learning to want to struggle learning to want to make sense of things and giving students the opportunity to do it at the right level for their age for their level of knowledge at this point giving them problems that will interest them and will challenge them but challenge them in a way that's so attractive that they want to be challenged. I mean 
there's a certain point at which you become a person who wants to solve hard problems, right? That doesn't happen because you never were given a hard problem. So figuring out what the progression of challenges to give somebody to make them the kind of person who wants to do those kinds of challenges is indeed the process of figuring out how to teach. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so for almost all the participants here, please note that Professor Queen is now in California where it's 10 in the night and you can see her enthusiasm to talk to us. I can't see any other question. Uh, but and I you... also had a, a five hour meeting today before this one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I couldn't see any other uh, question here. So uh, so then um, we can, I can, I think we can stop here. I would like to thank you for your time and the enthusiast, enthusiasm that you have given us today. Um, some of us may contact you for suggestions at a personal note. Yeah. Uh, I put my email on the I put my email on the first slide and I have asked you to share my slides with everybody and as a recording of this talk if you one of the things one of the reasons to record lectures is because when students want to hear something they don't get it the first time they can go back and hear it again so that that's a useful thing and you have that for this lecture thank you let's thank all of us thank you again thank you very much thanks you're very welcome And I guess I sign off, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. And good night. Good night. If I can find where I can get myself out of here. I have to stop sharing first. <laughs>